So, um, again, we've been in Acts for a little while, chapter 7 today, but I promised you that I wouldn't leave chapter 6 behind because we only got to the first half of it last week. If you missed out, let me just remind you kind of where we've been. And oh, by the way, if you don't have one of these books, they're free and they're at the, the exits. You can grab one, take two, and share with a friend. But, but I'm always encouraged by those who say, I have the book, I've been filling it in, and the journaling, the opportunity to make my own notes as I read in preparation of the sermon. It's always neat, Pastor, to see what I thought and then to find out what you thought. And sometimes they're even the same. So make sure you get one of those. But in Acts chapter 6 last week, here's one of the things we talked about in the first half, just to remind you. Um, if you were here last week, some of you may have walked out with a limp, and that was not intended. Some people have said to me before, Pastor, you just love stepping on toes, don't you? Not really, but if they're there, then I'm just making a step. But the first half of chapter 6 goes like this. So the apostles had been doing all this great work. They were defending the story of Jesus, the way of Jesus. They were trying to live in these special communities, and a lot of people started gathering around. Thousands of people would gather around. There was power in the early movement of the church. And there were so many people that, as you can imagine, more people equals more need. And so the needs of the gathering community were beginning to outgrow the bandwidth of the apostles. I mean, I feel this myself, even with our church, that, that we've gone so far as a body of faith but, but we've gone as far as Brent can go without a little bit more. And so hopefully we'll have an associate pastor before long. But, but my giftings, my bandwidth, my focus, my attention span is probably the hardest part. But there's a, a limit to all those things. And the apostles were finding this to be true for themselves as well. And the community around them also noticed this. They said, you know, apostles, y'all have a job to do, but there's some things that aren't getting done. And so the apostles speak back and they say, well, okay, well, we... If we, if we stop doing what we're doing or do it less, then, then we're going to miss out on what God's called us to. But that work you're calling out is important. So let's see who God might be calling to this work. And so they, they were looking for people filled with the Holy Spirit and full of faith, and they find seven people. Um, and, and I was saying here amongst us uh, this past week, just you get a twofer this morning, I was saying to the folks who had gathered that, that we have a lot of ministries in the life of the church that are not functioning fully as they could because the harvest is plentiful, plentiful and the workers are few. There's a lot of children, for instance, that run off to children's church every Sunday. And I said last week that if you're a mom or a dad in the room and your children go to children's church, that I believe you should be on a team that serves the children in that room once a month. It's, it's, it feels fair to me that all moms and dads who have children going back there, go back there if for no other reason to find out what's being taught and to make sure it aligns with what you're teaching at home. And for those of us who struggle to teach it at home, because there are a number of folks who go, I just don't know, Pastor, how to do this thing, how to be the spiritual leader in my home. Well, you volunteer in children's ministry, that's like a, a classroom in there. You can learn how to do it. Just go there and serve, watch how other people do it, and then copy them and do it the same way at home. It's, it's really as much for you as it is for us. And if you uh, have teenagers... Thomas, our youth pastor, and his team, he's got this great group of 22 high school kids that help serve the middle school kids. I mean, come on. You would just be stepping in to join in the fun and in the fray. And if you have a teenager who comes on Wednesday nights to Neon or on a Sunday night to a Freedom Night, and you've never been with them, you've never stuck around to see what's happening around here, if you are the spiritual leader of your home, I think it's worth sticking around every now and then to figure out what's being taught. And is that in line with what I'm teaching at home? Or can they give me some ideas of what to teach at home? Because I'm not taking responsibility for being the spiritual leader in my own home. This is the church as a, as a gathering was never intended to be a place where you pay some money for other people to do the stuff. Now, there's a role for that, obviously. It takes money to do stuff in the church, but it also takes people to do stuff in the church. And all of us are capable of giving in both ways at some level. One is not an excuse for the other or a substitute for the other. We bring all of who we are to the altar. And that was what I said last week. And some people felt like their toes had been stepped on, but um, you're welcome, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. But anyway, so, but I promise you we're going to come to the second half. And so here's the second half. It doesn't get any easier. Because by the end of this sermon, we have a guy who was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, who, who was called forward as one of the seven, and he ends up getting killed. I haven't asked you to do anything yet that's going to get you killed. Just saying. So the second half, ever, I've never been asked to do anything in defense of my faith that's going to get me killed. 
And that's kind of the moral of this whole sermon today. So keep listening. So in the second half of chapter six, let me just give a quick little run so we can get into chapter seven. But I wanted to, to step back in here because this is where we get introduced to Stephen. So Stephen was one of those seven. And the Bible says here that Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power. He performed great wonders and signs among the people. And opposition arose from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. These were Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia. And they began to argue with Stephen about what we're not really sure. We kind of have some hints given to us in a little bit, I'll tell you. But they could, they could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And since they couldn't stand up against him, this is a familiar trend if you've been here the last few weeks. They're, they're always trying to figure out how do we talk down this new thing? And they realize they can't because the Spirit of God is too powerful. But in this case, they couldn't speak against Stephen either. Now, what did they do to try to, to get over on him? Well, they conjured up some false witnesses. They talked some people into just telling flat out lies about him and about what he was teaching. Because if they could just lie enough about him and discredit him enough that they could get rid of him or come up with a good enough reason to harm him, punish him. So they did that. They secretly started persuading people. They got these folks together. They take them and they get to the Sanhedrin. But this is interesting. At the end of chapter six, they're in the Sanhedrin. They're all trying to bring up all these charges against him. But in, chapter, in verse 15, it says, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I don't know about you, but if people are bringing up falsehood about me and telling lies about me and telling people that I'm doing stuff that I never did and they're saying that I'm saying things that I never said before, the last thing you're gonna say of me in my face is I had the face of an angel. But this is what Stephen had. There's something about his presence. There's something about his countenance. Well, it's the Holy Spirit within him. And so then we move smoothly into chapter seven. The high priest then asked Stephen, are these charges true? These false charges, the made up charges. Now, this is interesting. In defending himself, he never defends himself. Instead, he preaches what for us will be a six to seven minute long sermon. Now, maybe he stopped, maybe there was cheering, maybe there was booing in the midst, it took him longer to get it all out. But six to seven minutes, you get the whole defense. Let me give it to you. Let me give it to you in its fullness. To this he replied. Are the charges true? Brothers and fathers. And if he were doing it today, he'd say, and sisters and mothers. Listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And God said to him, leave your country and your people and go to the land that I'll show you. So, so Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and he settled in Haran. And after the death of his father, God sent Abraham to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here not even enough ground to, to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no children. Do you remember he took him out and he said, look at the stars, they'll outnumber the stars? Wait, I don't even have a single child yet. Yeah, stick with me. God spoke to him in this way. 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They'll be enslaved and they'll be mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac. He was circumcised on the eighth day. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob. Jacob then became the father of the 12 patriarchs. Remember this? This is our story. This is what Stephen's trying to say to them. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, remember he was the youngest, the one who told his brothers, I've had dreams where you're bowing down to me. They throw him in a, in a well, they try to fake his death, and then they decide, nah, we'll just sell him to those folks who are headed into, into town as a slave. He says, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all of his troubles. God gave Joseph wisdom 
enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all of Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors couldn't find food. And when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. And then on their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. And after this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and the whole family, 75 of them in all. Jacob went down to Egypt where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought, uh, brought back to Shechem, placed in a tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. You can almost see them kind of leaning in. They know this story. I wonder where he's going next. Well, this is where he goes next. He says, as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. And, but then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. The new king came into power in Egypt and he, he dealt treacherously with our people. He oppressed our ancestors. He forced us to throw out our newborn babies so that they would die. And they know before you know. He's talking about Moses now. At that time, Moses was born. He was no ordinary child. For three months, he, he was cared for by his family. And when he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him, brought him up as her own son. Remember putting a basket, putting a river? Pharaoh's daughter was down bathing and got him, picked him up. Remember our story? It's our story. She raised him as her own son, and Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of the men mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense, and he avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day, Moses came. He came upon two Israelites who were fighting, and he tried to reconcile them. He said, men, you're brothers. Why are you hurting each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside, and he said, who made you ruler? Who made you judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And then when Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner, and he had two sons. After 40 more years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. You remember this story? Our story, Moses, burning bush. He was on fire but not consumed. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight and he went over to get a closer look. He, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. And Moses trembled with fear and he did not dare take a look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and have come to set them free. Now come, Moses. I'm going to send you back to Egypt. Brothers, fathers, sisters, mothers, this is the same Moses they rejected with the words. Who made you ruler and judge? Moses was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him at the bush. He led them out of Egypt. He performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. Don't you remember at Passover we remember these things? He did all of that. This is the Moses. This is the one who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness the angel spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our ancestors. He received living words to pass on to us. Maybe the Ten Commandments come to mind. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, remember he was traveling with Moses, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. Remember this, the golden calf in our story? The time we forsook Moses and the law, his leadership, and turned to idols that Aaron made available. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. 
But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun and moon and stars. And this agrees with what's written in the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings? 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You've taken up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God, Raphon, the idols that you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. It's like I can see Stephen going, yeah, good news. Remember this part? But our ancestors, they had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. God was with us. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern that he had seen. And after receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua, y'all remember Joshua? He brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. And it remained in the land until the time of David. You remember David? King David? David enjoyed God's favor. Asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But you'll remember it was Solomon, his son, who actually built it, who built the temple. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And after five or six minutes of just retelling their story, reminding them of the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of Father Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and of Joseph and of David and of Solomon, and he's just writing them into their own story. He's not refuting their charges, just retelling their story. But I think he senses something in the crowd. Maybe he senses something in himself. Maybe he senses something in them, because in verse 51, it all goes south. You stiff-necked people, your hearts, your ears, they're still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah. And now you've betrayed and murdered him. You've received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. It's like he was on trial and then flips the script. Now they're on trial. These who are upset about this Jesus and those who followed, these who say, this Jesus is trying to replace Moses, get rid of Moses. No, 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 I'm just trying to fulfill him. This Jesus, this this Stephen and others who are following him saying that Jesus has said he's gonna tear down the temple. Well, it appears that, that the Lord never wanted a physical temple in the first place. Stiff necked people. Resist the Holy Spirit, betray and murder the Messiah. You haven't obeyed the law. That's too much for them to take. And so things don't go well from there. When the members of the Sanhedrin, remember this is the legal authorities, they've been listening in on this. It was all good until they got called stiff-necked. When those folks heard this, they were furious. They gnashed their teeth. And I've never gnashed my teeth at anyone. I'm afraid it would hurt. I don't know what that looks like, but it doesn't look fun. It looks kind of angry. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Not seated at the right hand of God, but standing at the right hand of God. As somebody told me after first service, it was as if Jesus is watching, relaxing. It's like in one of them spirit-filled churches. All right, I see you, Stephen. And then he tells the people gathered, Jesus has stood up at the right hand of the Father. He seeks to bring his glory. He's watching. He's paying attention. It was too much for the people. So the Bible says they start yelling. They start plugging their ears, kind of like a young school child. La, 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 I can't hear you. They don't want the truth. As it was said in the movie, they can't handle the truth. And they run at him. And so they can get better loosened arms. They take off their cloaks. And the Bible says they go and they lay them at Saul's feet. We're going to get to meet Saul Saul becomes Paul. In a couple chapters, Saul encounters Jesus for himself. But in this chapter, Saul is standing there. I picture like the karate kid, like the guy who ran the bad dojo. It was the sensei, the white guy. I don't remember his name because I don't know actors. 
Um, but anyway, he was standing there and his, his little minions were over there causing trouble. And they're over there going, yes, yes. I think the people throwing the rocks had gone over to Saul and said, I know you're kind of a big deal around here. Here, we're gonna put our coats here. Make sure you watch this. Watch this. And I just wonder if Saul, while he's standing there watching this, if he sees and hears what Stephen does at the very end of this chapter. It says he empties his spirit and he offers the people who are throwing rocks at him forgiveness. And I kind of wonder if chapter seven, Saul watching this go down, if that's what started to sort of till the ground for what would come for him two chapters later. Here's the thing. I have found in my life that the truth hurts. Sometimes it hurts the one hearing it, and sometimes it hurts the one telling it. But the truth must be told. And in Acts chapter seven, you've got a truth teller being killed by stones and hearts of stone being ravaged by the truth he has just spoken. And he becomes for us the very first martyr. Now, the Greek word martus is where we get martyr. And the first word in the definition, if you go and look it up, is witness. And so as I said at the very beginning of this, I've not asked you to do anything yet that's gonna get you killed. Hanging out with children will be good for you. Being a mentor, a spiritual father, mother, grandfather, grandmother to some teenagers to make sure that this faith of ours doesn't die in their lifetime, it's not gonna kill you. It'll be hard, it ain't gonna kill you. Be a witness for the Lord. Be a witness for the Lord. Be honest about who he's always been. Be honest about where you fit in his story. Be honest about all the ways that you and the people around you who claim to follow Jesus are no longer following and obeying the rules of following after Jesus. Start speaking that up. Start admitting it or calling it into question in the people who proclaim themselves followers of Jesus, and it won't go well. And I think that's why from time to time, I've been struck by a couple of things. See, normally at the end of a sermon, I give you a handful of points you can go home and, and grow with. And, but really at the end of this message, at the end of this chapter, I'm just left with questions. And maybe the questions will take you deeper than any sort of tied in a ribbon, beautiful message would do for you. I know for me, I've been asking myself two questions as I read through this chapter. I just wanna ask them of you as well. You may not have an answer immediately. But I hope that these, these questions will not haunt you, but these questions will encourage you and spur you on in the days ahead. These are the questions. What does my martus, what does my witness cost me? I mean, what does my witness really cost me? After most of my sermons, which are intended to be a witness, most of what I get is, that was a great sermon, Pastor. Man, I really appreciated that word, Pastor. Man, I really needed to hear that, Pastor. No one's ever thrown a rock at me. Not even a tomato. In general, if I'm not careful because of my own fear of really it costing me something to bear witness, I do what the Bible says may happen one day that people will start listening to what their itching ears want to hear. And I myself, if I'm not careful, can be a person who just comes here to give them a little scratch. There's some stuff in here that you don't want to hear. And I know this because there's stuff in here I don't want to hear either. It's going to cost me. It's going to cost me of some habits. It's going to cost me of the way I spend my time. It's going to cost me the way I spend my money. It's going to cost me the way that I treat those who vote differently than me or believe differently than me. It's going to cost. And I'm not sure I'm ready to pay the bill. I've been in a handful of situations just this past week where good Christian people are riled up together against the other. The way of Jesus has no room for that. No room. 
those who follow Jesus are one. This is what Jesus prayed. Father, that they would be one as you and, the, as you and I are one. There's room for disagreement. There's no room for hate. And there's no room for vilifying. What will my witness cost me? And second, how have I been playing it safe in my own witness? I've been asking the Lord to, to unveil and reveal to me those places where I really had something to say and I just stayed quiet. It was just easier to play it safe. Not to let anybody know that I was a Jesus follower. This just isn't the setting for that. But when, when Stephen reminds us what God said about, you know, the most high doesn't live in a place built by human hands, I start to be quite convicted that, that if we're not careful, we could build a really safe, private place to gather to worship the Lord. And we could keep all of it here to ourselves. And your pastor could just make sure there's plenty of butts in the seats and plenty of dollars in the bank account and plenty of programs on your calendar to keep you from leaving. But the Lord hasn't called us to this. He hasn't called me to that. The Lord said that he would enter into us, that we would become his temple. It's made by his hands, not ours. That he would breathe his spirit into his creation and we would be his martyrs. You don't have to die for your faith to be a martyr. But you must live it. You must show it and you must tell it until the whole world knows. It's hard for me to do, and I'm paid to do it. I can't imagine how hard it is for you to do it for free. So I'm gonna pray that God would give us courage and strength that we're gonna need just this week to do what he's called us to. So if y'all would join me in prayer, I'd love to, to offer one. God, I confess for myself and for those who've gathered this morning, my brothers and sisters, that we've not always been faithful to you in word or in deed. There have been times in my life and in the lives of those here in this space that where we said, you are Lord. And then we took you right back off the throne. God, everybody in this room has their own answers to the questions. But the questions remain. How is my relationship with Jesus costing me? What is at risk? What is at risk to be a follower of Jesus in my life? You don't call us all to, to say things and do things so that people will throw rocks at us, but, but you set Stephen today as our model. God, would you give us the courage to when we have the choice between playing it safe and or living and speaking in love, admitting who it is, in fact, that we follow, proclaiming that we are not the centers of our own universe, you are, aligning our lives with the way of your son, Jesus, instead of aligning ourselves with the way of our social media feeds. God, we can't do this without you. We can't do any of this without you. And you knew that. That's why you breathed your Holy Spirit into us. So would you stoke that fire again? Would you... Wake us from our sleepwalking? Would you wake us up to your presence within us? Would you give us strength to make it known to a watching and a waiting world? We offer ourselves here at this altar, asking that you do what you would do for our good and for your glory. We come in Jesus' name.